of the Paideia Institute. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, latest uh, instance of our online lecture series with my good friend, uh, my old friend, Chris Childers. Um, I, um, I'm going to start by encouraging you, if you are uh, decent, to turn your camera on. Uh, it's just uh, nicer to not be um, talking to a, a void uh, as, a, as a Zoom lecturer. I know some people, maybe you're, you know, in transit or whatever, then that's understood. But if you, if you, if you can just to sort of, you know, promote engagement and a feeling of like, there's actually people here. It's, it's nice when people's cameras are turned on if you can. So thank you for doing that. Um, all right. Uh, so I will start by introducing Chris. Um, Chris and I met in Reginald Foster's summer program in uh, 2006. And I'll never forget uh, an early encounter we had where he told me about uh, a translation of Horace by A.E. Hausman. Um, and uh, I, I was a fan of Horace, but I did not know this uh, translation yet. And there was a particular verse. This was, although this was 15 years ago, I, I don't, I still remember this moment where he said there's a, a verse of Horace 4-7, uh, which is in Latin, Domna tamen caleres reparant caelestia lunae nos ubi decudimus u pius eneas u dives tulis dancus pulvis adumbra sumus. And, and Chris said, you've got a uh, Hausman translation of this is so great. But oh, whatever the sky-led seasons mar moon upon moon that repairs them with her beams. Come we where Tulis and where Ancus are and good Aeneas, we are dust and dreams. And uh, I felt a shiver run down my spine when he said that. And it was one of the great moments of connection with poetry uh, that I've had in my life and, and it continued to provide inspiration for me in my career. Um, and Chris, Chris just had uh, this natural sensibility for poetry, I could tell even back then. So I was not surprised when I heard a few years later that he had been um, given this opportunity to translate lyric poetry for Penguin. Um, now that opportunity came uh, something like 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and Chris has been working, 14? Yes. <laughs> so Chris has been working on this thing and I've been waiting for it for, for a very long time. Um, so uh, to have it finally come into the light and to see the uh, deserving praise lavished on it by all sorts of major figures uh, in the field has been extremely satisfying for me. Um, so that's my little personal anecdote about Chris, but I'll also give you his academic biography. Uh, he, he studied classics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and he has an MFA in creative writing and poetry from uh, John Hopkins. He's taught Latin um, at, at, at several schools um, and uh, is also an avid uh, squash player and coach and a sedulous uh, parent of fish and budgies, um, or at least caretaker. So um, that is my introduction for you, Chris. I'm very excited to um, hear this talk. I'll also note Chris is in the, pro uh, the uh, process of moving from Baltimore to the LA area, Los Angeles. So if any of you are there, uh, I recommend looking him up. You can follow his exploits on his um, website, which I'm gonna put in the chat right now, which is uh, ChristopherChildersPoet.com. All right. So with that, I give you Chris Childers. Thank you, Chris, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Jason. Such a uh, uh, delightful, delightful to to listen to and reminisce. That uh, uh, translation of Hausman uh, has always has long been a favorite uh, favorite poem of mine. Of course, Hausman's favorite uh, poem as well. Uh, and you know, and I should say, yes, this the book has taken so long to write that it itself is confused about how old it is. At one place, it says more than ten years now. At another place, it says thirteen. Uh, it started in November of 2010, and the publication is uh, happened at the end of March of 2024. So maybe it's thirteen and a half years, but I think fourteen is the the number I'm I'm going to settle on. 
Uh, I also just want to thank Jason in particular and the Paideia Institute for uh, all the support you've given to me and to encouragement to my writing and translation over this long process. Uh, and thank you to all of you for, for coming. Uh, I'm going to do a, a bit of a kind of a spiel here on uh, kind of introducing a couple things about the book. Uh, that is, uh, the, the book is, of course, the uh, Penguin book of Greek and Latin lyric verse. It's a uh, uh, sort of a, you know, a hefty customer, a uh, sort of like a ghost trap from Ghostbusters. It's 14 years of my own ghost in it. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, start with a poem from Archilochus, who is the uh, first poet in the book. Uh, I can't really, the number of the poem is uh, 128. O oh, heart, my heart, turned upside down by cares that have no cures. Get up, thrust out your chest and take a stand. Don't be afraid. Go face your enemies now hunkering in their ambuscade with firmness. Don't be overjoyed if victory is yours. And if you lose, don't head home wailing and collapse dismayed. No, grieve when things are rotten and enjoy your days of bliss but not too much. No, all men's lives are up and down like this. So part of the reason I start with this poem, not just because I, it, I find it heartening and I like it, though I do, is that those of you who are uh, more versed in the classics might wonder what Archilochus is doing in a book of lyric verse. Uh, Archilochus is, of course, the father of Iambus, that's, this is what he was known as, and in classical poetry, the generic distinction between lyric and other kinds of, of verse uh, is a little bit less straightforward than in the kind of romantic or post-romantic troika of lyric, dramatic, and epic poetry, which uh, Goethe uh, first set out for us and which Glenn Most uh, talks about very helpfully in his uh, fantastic afterword to, to the book. Uh, Archilochus, uh, as an iambic poet, uh, so, so to, to backtrack a little bit, a lot of the generic distinctions of archaic poetry have to do first with the occasion for performance that was intended and also with the musical accompaniment suited for that occasion. So, of course, the word lyric derives from the lyre, and these are poems which would have been composed for performance to the lyre. Uh, but other kinds of poems were composed for performance to other instruments. There is, of course, the cithara, there is the owl loss, the kind of double reed pipe, which would have sounded something like an oboe, and uh, was the usual uh, instrument for the performance of elegiac poetry. Uh, and then iambus. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we know. Maybe that's also the owl loss. I'm not sure if we know. Uh, but I, uh, iambus also has a particular type of meter associated with it, and a particular type of tone, usually insulting, invective, a uh, scurrilous kind of poetry. Though this poem of Archilochus is not really that. Uh, so they have these kinds of uh, vibes, uh, different these different genres. And why did I include? Uh, all of these different kinds of poetry, plus pastoral, plus epigram, uh, plus even a, a, a couple hymns in a book of lyric poetry. And the reason really lies in what I imagine to be the contemporary reader's expectations on taking up a book of lyric poetry, which as a number of the reviews have pointed out, we think of lyric poetry as synonymous with poetry. Uh, and we tend to think of it at partly or largely as a result of Goethe as being first person utterance, uh, short poems with a certain degree of intensity, a degree of emotional, um, uh, emotional expression, uh, something. Uh, uh, so so um, and, and, and so as a as a poet myself, as well as a translator or a classicist, I. Uh, really kind of kept both of these definitions, both of these understandings, the, the technical strict sense of you know, certain kinds of meters, certain kinds of performance, uh, as well as that looser uh, kind of romantic or post-romantic uh, sense in mind in, in selecting these poems. Unfortunately, I didn't also include uh, choral 
tragic or, or dramatic choral lyric as uh, the, the TLS review uh, lamented simply because I, I don't know, I wanted to finish the book at some point. So uh, it is, it took a long time as it is and is a, a bit of a, a big boy. Anyway, uh, I'm going to launch into a, uh, a lyric poem proper now, um, one that fits the strict definition, uh, one that everyone probably knows, or many of you anyway. This is Sappho's first fragment. O deathless Aphrodite, enthroned in glamour, wild weaver, Zeus's daughter, take my part, I pray, and do not yoke with pain and fever, lady, my heart. But come here now, if you ever heard my voice with a heedful ear when I called to you on high, and going from your father's golden house, came down the sky, charioted out of heaven in a hurry, through midair by a team of lovely sparrows, their wing beats whirring in a crowded flurry over the furrows. And there they were, and you, as a smile played on your immortal lips, so oh blessed one, you asked, what was the matter now? What made me call again? What was the main thing that my maniac heart hoped would happen? Sappho, what love or lust must I persuade this time to take you back? Now who's unjust? For if she's fleeing now, she will soon pursue. If she says no to gifts, she'll give them soon. And if she feels no love and refuses to, she'll change her tune. Appear to me now again. Release me from desire's stranglehold. Fulfill, provide all that my heart has hoped for. Goddess come, fight at my side. So this poem comes as the Archilochus, comes from the first section of the book, which focuses on archaic poetry. The book is divided into four sections, archaic poetry, which goes up until the uh, Persian, uh, the defeat of the Persians at the Battle of Salamis and Plataea in 479. Uh, then there is the section of classical lyric, kind of a decadent period for lyric that runs until the death of Alexander in 323. Uh, instead of Hellenistic poetry, I have post-classical lyric because uh, my selection of Greek literature from that period continues past the end of the Hellenistic period, which uh, is dated to the death of Cleopatra in 30 BC and on into the Roman period. The Garland of Philip, for example, which is the second major part of the Greek anthology, was presented to Nero. Uh, in around uh, in the 60s uh, AD. Uh, and then the Roman period, which uh, uh, begins in the middle of the second century, but in the book starts with Catullus in the middle of the first century and goes to the, the death of Marshall. The key feature of the archaic period is uh, one of song culture. Uh, some of this might be uh, somewhat implied by what I said before about the performance context, occasions, and instruments that uh, give really provide the origin of genre for, for this poetry. But in a world before televisions, before uh, printed reading material, for the most part, uh, both education and recreation were performed largely in the context of song, public song at celebrations, at um, uh, drinking parties called symposia at religious events uh, uh, before battles, uh, uh, various uh, kinds of, of, of public performance. And uh, so in this context, the idea of lyric is, I think, as very different from what we tend to think of the lonely poet sitting, sitting in a garret pouring out uh, uh, his or her uh, soul onto, onto blank paper. There is uh, a degree of privacy or publicity, but these are much more public poems uh, in general. And that I think is a large part of what makes Sappho so mysterious and interesting and so extraordinary, because here is a poem which has this public form in the form of the cletic or invocatory hymn to the goddess Aphrodite, but has really 
kind of personal subject matter. She's praying for help in a particular romantic situation. It's difficult to imagine the context, the public context where for which Sappho composed these poems. Uh, but that's uh, so much of why I think they're just a real, a real, a real treasure um, to uh, that that they're preserved, or as as much of them um, as preserved as it is. I'm going to jump to the Hellenistic period now to uh, uh, Alexandria, Hellenistic Alexandria, the birdcage of the muses where the scholar poets toiled away in the library of, uh, of Alexandria, uh, where I think we can, uh, for the first time, fairly speak of a book culture in contrast to the song culture of archaic Greece. Uh, and much of this uh, poetry, I think, is influenced very much by the rise of prose. You know, one thing that surprises students uh, uh, I, or is, is, is to learn that uh, poetry is actually the more primitive, the more original art form, that prose is a kind of sophisticated latecomer when Herodotus comes around to uh, challenge Homer with his uh, true history uh, of the Persian Wars. And when Plato... Uh, takes objection to education through poetry as a form of, of mind control and kicks the poets out of the Republic. I believe that the uh, Hellenistic scholar poets are responding to, especially to the critiques of Plato in trying to create a poetry uh, which is not subject to these kinds of uh, the, the, the kinds of madness that uh, it's not a kind of oral composition where um, the poet sort of doesn't know what they're saying sometimes. This is a highly polished poetry, a deeply reflective poetry, and in which a, a poet like Callimachus spends a lot of time arguing, actually, with other poets at the library about the right ways of writing poetry. Um, he uh, is very careful with the kinds of metrical choices that, that he makes. Um, and uh, one of the major genres of this period is the epigram, the small polished poem. Um, uh, and here, uh, often imitative of poems that would really have been, uh, you know, uh, have, have accompanied dedications in temples or, or epitaphs or things like that. Uh, and so this one, uh, you can uh, sort of uh, move back, move back up to the, the Callimachus. Um, yeah. Uh, there it is. This one is a uh, an epigram, a very famous epigram, a little higher, a little higher to uh, 34. Um, this one is uh, an epigram for his friend Heraclitus, not the pre-Socratic philosopher, who, um, yeah, well, I'll, just, uh, I'll just read it. When I heard Heraclitus, you were dead. I thought of all the sons we'd talked to bed those nights, and the tears came. Dear guest, I know that you were ashes long and long ago. And yet your nightingales are singing still. Death kills all things, but then he cannot kill. I think a, a very uh, beautiful poem and one which may uh, be thinking in terms of the material life of poetry uh, in books uh, surviving the, uh, the death of the, the authors. Uh, Roman poetry, sort of by contrast, as I argue, and just uh, borrowing uh, from Dennis Feeney, the Princeton uh, classicist, uh, in his book Beyond Greek, actually grows out of translation from Greek poetry. It tends to, it emerges in Campania, sort of southern Italy, Magna Graecia, Great Greece, in uh, the middle of the second century, uh, in large measure because the uh, uh, where, where there were there were Greeks, there were Romans, there were other Italian peoples, all kind of uh, mixed together, and uh, the Greeks uh, tended to perform plays, especially uh, I think very popular at that time was the New Comedy of Menander, and uh, Roman poets uh, started to figure out how to translate that into Latin to give the uh, Latin speaking uh, parts of the population, the same experience as, as the Greek. So the Roman literature, Latin literature derives from translation from Greek, but that does not really make it derivative, at least according to Feeney, who, who argues, and I repeat, that uh, perhaps translating another um, 
another culture's literature in the second century BC was perhaps the most original thing the Romans could have done. Literature in the Mediterranean at this time was precisely that which did not get translated. Um, but uh, so I think that that's that certainly interesting to me and seems true. And uh, so we're going to turn to a, a Roman poet of uh, a Roman poet, Catullus, who is known for having translated previous poems. He translates one of Callimachus. He translates another one of uh, Sappho, very famously. And uh, I think that this Callimachus epigram also uh, influenced one of Catullus's most famous poems, uh, which is poem uh, 101. Uh, you can scroll down to that now. I think maybe also uh, Meliager's epigram for uh, his girlfriend or epitaph for his girlfriend Heliodora uh, might also be in the background here of this very beautiful and famous, famous poem for which Catullus wrote for his brother who died while he was abroad in, in Asia Minor working for the provincial administration there. Conveyed through many nations, many seas, brother, I've come to these sad obsequies to bear you proper rites of burial and call your ashes mute beyond recall, since fortune sundered us from one another. How far, alas, from your deserts, dear brother. These sorry gifts of old inherited, gifts which our fathers' fathers gave their dead, take them, soaked where your brother's teardrops fell, and the brother, for all time, hail and farewell. The final poem I'm going to read from the Roman, as part of this introduction, from uh, also from Latin, uh, is perhaps the most famous poem of the Roman Alcaeus, Horace. Alcaeus was a contemporary of Sappho, uh, also a, a, a country, a countryman of Sappho's, both from from Lesbos. And Alcaeus wrote a number of drinking songs in a particular meter. Uh, the greater Asclepiad, or anyone who, who cares, uh, which Horace uses for this particular uh, drinking poem, which gives us the, the famous phrase, carpe diem, uh, seize the day, or as uh, I have it, as many Latin teachers will tell you, pluck the day like a grape from the vine. So you can scroll down to that one. Um, this is uh, Horace's carpe diem ode to end on a more uh, uplifting note. Don't ask, it's not for us to know what in the heavens will bestow on you and me, Luconoe. Ignore all that astrology from Babylon. It's better just to bow to what will be and must, whether Jupiter will send more winters or this one's the end that wears out the Etruscan sea against the rocks relentlessly. Be wise, have taste, let the wine decant and prune back your extravagant hopes for forever. Life is brief. While we sit talking, time, that thief escapes. Don't let your life delay until tomorrow. Pluck today. One thing I'd, I'd like to say about this poem is that uh, the coincidence of the meanings be wise and have taste in a single Latin word, sapias, has always struck me as particularly wise, particularly beautiful and something uh, I love that the Epicurean Horace brings out in this poem. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, I do appreciate all of you uh, sitting, talking with, or sitting while I talk. Uh, with me. So I, I'm grateful for your time and, and your attention. I'm really interested to hear what kinds of questions uh, you may have. And thanks for coming. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was great. Um, we definitely have plenty of time for questions, um, which uh, um, I'd love to entertain from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll start with one. Um, which is uh, about your, 
uh, willingness, let's say, uh, to, to, to translate with rhyme, um, which I've read a lot of Loeb translations of Greek and Latin poetry. And, um, you know, based on my experience, that seemed to go out of fashion sometime around, you know, the early 1910s or something like that. And, and you don't see it a lot. I, I suspect, uh, mostly because it's quite hard um, uh, to, to do it and pull it off in a way that is still uh, doesn't sound silly, which, which of course you do. But I, I'm curious um, what you have to say about rhyme as a, as a feature of poetry when translating, you know, Greek and Latin, which obviously was structured around other uh, form, formalist qualities like uh, syllable length, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. And I think this is definitely something that's that's on uh, the minds of, of classicists in general. Um, the 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 sort of uh, programmatic reason for the use of rhyme in the translation uh, has to do really with uh, with the kind of overall conception of, of what is the value of including the Greek and Latin poets in the same book translated by the same person uh, and what I'm, what I mean there is that uh, there are so many poems. Uh, there, there, there are meters. There are stanzas. There are shapes of poems which are reused. You know, which are used by Sappho and Alcaeus, and then reused by Catullus and Horace, for example. Uh, and in my feeling, you can imitate some of these meters in English. I, well, I, well, what I will say first is that I think that the coincidence, the fact that Horace is using this or that meter from, from Sappho or, or from Anacreon, say, uh, the fact that these, these forms are being repeated throughout this corpus seems to me significant and important. And it's a big part of my own experience when I read these poems in the original. If I read elegiac couplets, I read Ovid's elegiac couplets, for example, I think about the way that this form has been handled by other poets going back to, say, Mimnermis or even, even Archilochus, who has some elegiac couplets. So that kind of continuity and also sometimes discontinuity of form is a big thing, of metrical form is a big part of what I respond to. But I don't really believe it's a good idea to imitate all of these meters in English. In some cases, it's impossible. For example, where there are runs of three or four or five short un short syllables in a row. English cannot put five unstressed syllables in a row. It just can't imitate that particular feature or four or five stressed syllables in a row or like long syllables. Um, uh, so that there are places where you can't do it. And then I think really you have to already know those meters in order to really recognize what's going on. And I think that recognition is a big part of what I respond to. So what I, I use rhyme as a way to address what I would view as the metrical paucity of English, the fact that we don't have as many meters in English as uh, the Greek and, and Roman poets have access to, uh, to kind of increase the number of recognizable forms and stanza shapes, whether a non-stanza shape in the case of Pindar, say, uh, or the kind of repeated stanzas that we find in the Alcaic and the Sapphic stanza or the Elegiac couplet. Uh, so that's kind of the programmatic reason, uh, because I think that the use of rhyme enables those connections across poems and across centuries to be brought more, much more clearly into focus. Uh, I think there might also be an argument for it uh, on the grounds of the translation itself, because I can tell you that this book would have taken a lot less long to translate if it did not have any rhymes in it. It would have been much quicker work, and I think also inferior work. I think that the pressure, the compositional pressure which rhyme provides, forces one to slow down, to really sit with the with the lines, with the stanzas, to turn them over in 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 one's head or in in my head and. I think that ultimately, as long as you don't rush, as long as you don't come out with an inferior solution just in order to get through it and get on to the next thing, I think that the uh, effect on the quality, the the strength or the intensity, the um, whatever, the just the the, uh, the 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 verse is is improved by the extra pressure that rhyme puts on on composition. So uh, those are my 
my two my two answers one of them uh yeah the, the continuity of forms across the tradition and the other is that i think rhyme makes me a better translator thanks chris um are there any other questions from the audience i have a question um about the writing process, Chris, I think that um, it's impossible to sort of read or hear you read that poem, those those translations without um, appreciating your own giftedness as a poet. Um, and I know that like approaching writing your own poetry as a, as to writing translation, like it's a different there's a different muse for that, right? So I'm just interested in um, your, you know, how you go about approaching a poem, what your what your writing process is like um, when you're acting at the same time as poet and as translator. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think first of all that translating is significantly easier for me than than poetry than writing my own poems because. In trans translating is a technical challenge. The thing that you're the, trying to say has already been said. And the goal is to say it as, as eloquently and uh, accurately as possible to make it fit. But it's, it's more of a kind of a, a word game. Uh, it also is a critical uh, a critical skill that to be able to read the poem and to, and to understand what is maybe most important to convey here, or where does the poetic energy of this poem come from? This or that word, or this enjambment, this interstanzaic enjambment, some, some feature, this sound, or this combination of sounds in this particular place. So there's a critical mind, uh, which is kind of engaged in, in figuring out what uh, the, the poem you're translating is doing. And then there is the sort of, uh, technical and uh, kind of problem solving part of the brain, trying to figure out how to do this as eloquently um, and uh, uh, sort of smoothly as possible in English. But the thing you're saying has been said when it comes to writing my own work, uh, when you could say anything, you have to both solve the technical problems and also figure out what it is in fact that is worth saying at the moment. To me, that's more challenging. I think others maybe have a, have a more sort of fluid stability to associate and just kind of throw out ideas. Um, but uh, that's that's sort of how I how I feel about it. Um, I don't know if that is enough to to answer the question when it comes to the actual. I do have a quick follow up. Oh, no, no. Sorry, you were about to answer it. Sorry. No, go on. Oh, I was going to say that when it comes to the actual process of, of translating and versifying, um, it's not quite the way Richard Wilbur described his own his his poetry writing as uh, somebody asked him, what does it look like when you write poems? And I think his answer was catatonia, you know, just staring like motionless at a piece of paper for, for hours. It's not quite like that for me, but it does involve kind of going line by line or couplet by couplet, sort of structure. They, they, I take the structures one at a time. Uh, try to first get the best critical understanding I can of them. And then it's a lot of turning it over and over in my head, using the sources. Yeah, I do use rhyming dictionaries, um, looking, which are as kind of like groups of words, you know, thinking of all the possible words that I could end this line with, what do they rhyme with, uh, and just kind of uh, treating it as 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 problem solving. Um, and it's a, it's an extremely engaging and uh, diverting way to spend your time. And my quick follow up is: Do you work at do you work on one poem at a time, or do you find yourself like having sort of an intertextuality in your translation process as well? Yeah, I think mostly one poem at a time. It may be that that sometimes. Um, uh, you know, a poem will uh, suggest itself as, um, uh, you know, that uh, like, oh, I'm this one, I should go translate this one. And I think maybe one one big exception to that would be uh, Sappho 31 and Catullus 51, where Catullus translates Sappho and I had to to into Latin and I had to translate both the Greek of Sappho and the Latin of Catullus. 
and try to make them both cover basically the same content while sounding different. Uh, and so I think those I definitely put next to each other and uh, kind of worked on a little bit side by side. Uh, and at other times there, there may be something kind of similar, but basically I, I go, you know, one, one, one unit at a time. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think Lisa is next. Thanks for all this, Chris. It's really good to see you again after all these years. Um, so I I teach intro Latin and I teach French and my students are always asking me how you can supplement the experience of the music that would have been instrumentally present when reading either an original or translation. And I'm just wondering what thought you've given to this and certainly it would be different in each section of your book each time and even within that. So I'd just be interested in anything you have to say about that part. Yeah, well, it's great to great to see you too. Uh, has has been a long time. Um, I think I'm not really qualified uh, to answer this question. Um, that there are people who work interestingly on the music. I think especially the music of like Greek. Uh, a choral lyric or things like that. Uh, Anna Conser, who is a, a friend of, of Paideia, is one person who uh, jumps to mind. I think Armand Dangour, who is an Oxford and Oxfordian uh, active on Twitter, is another person who uh, has, has kind of written about this. Uh, I am, you know, aware uh, of the kind of instrumental accompaniment and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, I don't really think thinking thinking about that was not part of my process. The the metrical, the music of the meter, which is a more intellectual kind of music, uh, uh, is the one that I really listened to in translating and and worked worked on. Um, maybe one further thought, though, I, I do remember, and Jason probably remembers this too. Reggie telling us that we can use for sapphics, we can use uh, uh, a particular the tune of a Gregorian chant for um, uh, of, of the hymn to St. John the Baptist, I think. Is that, is that right? Uh, or that uh, you can No, use it's the Iste Confessor, I believe. Uh, the St. John the, isn't the St. John the Baptist one, the one where we get do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do from? And uh, the Sapphics was the Iste Confessor, or maybe both of them work for Sapphics, actually, now that you mention it. Hmm. Well, it could be, I forget. I have a kind of, I don't want to, to 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 actually try to try to sing it for you, uh, I think that people would would go scurrying rightly, uh, but uh, yeah, that there maybe um, some there might be some Gregorian chant too that you could use to um, uh, you know, uh, in the same way you can sing most of Emily Dickinson to the tune of uh, um, you know uh, Amazing Grace or Gilligan's Island you can take this uh, particular kind of Gregorian chant tune and sing uh, sing sapphics to it so you're right Chris yeah it's the it's called Utquant Laxis is the hymn I'll, yeah. uh, I'll paste it in here if anyone's too yeah. mm -hmm. uh all right I think next is Damon all right thanks for that um I'm I'm curious uh, about the connection, if there is one, between your um, um, squash playing and coaching to your uh, either translating or your uh, poetry composition. Given that squash seems like a a very metrical game, uh, physically confined space, but also quite an elegant game too. So, I was wondering if if that informs your your translation or your or your poetry generally. Well, that's a that's a very lovely question. I think uh, squash is music. Is that is that the title of a book by by Jim Zug? Maybe about squash. Um, I and I think I have sort of a frustrating answer to this, which is not really. I mean, I'm actually more of a tennis player. I started tennis and kind of learned squash as part of my kind of you know boarding school teaching coaching kind of things that I've that I've done. I love squash. I love watching it. I'm not very good actually. I'm I'm okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, not not really a squash player to to speak of. I mean, there is also, of course, Robert Frost's famous analogy, like, uh, well, I guess writing formal verse like is like playing tennis. If right, what if writing free verse is like playing tennis with the net down? At least that's a, a witticism that that's generally uh, attributed to him. Um, 
but but beyond that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it is uh, another thing that's often said about squash is that it's like chess played at uh, what like a thousand miles an hour or something, something like that. Uh, I am not a chess player, uh, but uh, I do think at a much slower pace that kind of especially some of the more elaborate stanzaic structures and for example like pindar when i am working on that forces you to look pretty far ahead uh in the stanza perhaps in a way that a squash rally might be constructed from uh you know a, a number of shots in advance so so maybe maybe there is a little something uh something to that but uh yeah i've never thought of it in those terms before thanks, thanks. for the Okay, uh, I think Grace is next. Um, so you talked about having a kind of critical understanding, critical approach to the poetry before you translated it into English. And I was wondering, like, to what extent you would deal with other translations before or during your translation process, or did you kind of put them out of your mind? Or I was just wondering about that approach. <laughs> Well, you know, actually, I think that's a it's a great it's a great question, and it's worth um, uh, maybe ex expatiating on uh, a little bit because I, I did at times. Uh, and the Callimachus poem that I read before has a very famous translation by William Johnson Corey. You know, they told me Heraclitus. They told me you were dead. They brought me bitter news to hear and bitter tears to shed. Uh, and uh, as uh, I think Alicia Stallings pointed out in her review in The Telegraph, my translation does actually kind of nod. I think I, that you were ashes long and long ago is sort of language borrowed a little bit from from the from the quarry. So in that case, I felt that that poem was was very much, um, you know, part of the the English. Uh, literary tradition and that kind of recognizing a bit of an echo would be would be a good way. Uh, a good way to go. Um, uh, another one, Jason mentioned at the beginning, Hausman's translation of uh, of De Fugere Niwes, and that was necessarily because I memorized it long, well before I, I even sat down to translate that poem. Uh, that was was very much on my mind, and I had to try to to say to to um, you know use different use different words, which at times was was a little bit uh, a little bit difficult to kind of get Hausman's out of my out of my head and and do my own uh, translation of that poem. I I think uh, that maybe I might have um, at least I, I certainly came up with something with something different. Uh, it's certainly not not better than Hausman's. Uh, uh, it places it's de it's definitely not not as good. Uh, but um, you know it's just a poem that uh, you know I, I I obviously love in general. I think uh, I mostly didn't really look at other translations. Every now and then I would use them after finishing to kind of go back and see, ooh, you know, this guy or this translation did this particularly well. And I think I could kind of punch up the voice here where I could uh, rethink this or that particular choice um, that that I that I made or just try to kind of keep I could I could use them sometimes to try to force me to kind of keep working on on my own. Um, but uh, yeah, in the most part, I tried to just stick with the, the Latin or Greek text. I did tend to use the lobes. I didn't want to make mistakes. And uh, every now and then, too, the, the lobe has had, has it right, you know? Every now and then, just the, the literal translation is just is the right one. And you just sometimes there's no way around it, or I couldn't come up with a way around it. So every now and then, there's, a, there's, a, there's some phrases uh, like that that I wouldn't say were borrowed from the lobe so much as... Uh, uh, just like we would have arrived at them independently, you know, that like that was just it's just the right translation. Uh, Chris, I um, you mentioned memorization, um, and I'm going to tell a, a short anecdote about our our student days together by way of this uh, other question. Uh, Chris, Chris and I were once uh, roommates together on a summer program in Greece, and um, while he was taking a shower, I heard this. Uh, Vatic uh, sort of sound emanating from the shower, which sounded like Greek. And uh, <laughs> when he came out, I was like, Chris, what, what were you doing in the shower, man? And he was like, oh, that was Pindar. And so then uh, I asked uh, follow-up questions um, to, uh, to see how much poetry Chris had actually memorized. And 
it turned out to be a terrifying amount. Um, he had a lot of Pindar. He had quite a bit of Dante, although he didn't speak Italian. He had it memorized in Italian. And I can't remember how many verses of Virgil it was, but it was like at least an entire book or something like that. So um, Chris has memorized a huge amount of poetry in all languages. And I, I'm very curious, Chris, about if you could talk about the sort of um, synaptic process of writing poetry when you have a lot of just verse in your head and what that's like. Sure. Well, uh, at first, maybe I think I might uh, want to, you know, try to recreate a, a little bit of what I was of what I was saying in the shower, uh, because, you know, it, it's it's always worth uh, getting a little Pindar into the air. Um, I th probably it was the beginning of, of Olympian one. Uh, Ariston min hudor. Just a little bit of the beginning, which I will give my translation of. Water is best, while of all riches gold, like fire in the dark, shines well apart. But if it's games, my heart, you want to him. What star could you behold more warm or more unrivaled in the air than the bright sun? Or what contest compare to Zeus's at Olympia? Not one. From that source, poems that all of us repeat are launched in wise men's minds as they entreat and offer praises up to Cronus' son at the rich and happy hearth of Hieron who, plucking such success as few are able, wields just sway in flock-rich Sicily and shines in the poetry we men recite around his friendly table. So just a little, a little Pindar uh, out of the shower this time. Uh, I do think that uh, memor memorizing poetry is the single best thing to do for anybody who wants to become skillful at writing in traditional forms. Uh, I remember that uh, I think Anthony Hecht, uh, one of my my favorite uh, po fairly recently deceased poets, I, 20th century, uh, died in 2004, said at some point that um, I don't know any poet worth anything who doesn't have a great deal, and I mean a very great deal of poetry by heart. Uh, remember that my college professor, Alan Shapiro, gave similar, uh, similar advice uh, that uh, at a certain point, if you've memorized enough, you won't be able to write badly. And I think that just having, uh, having those rhymes, those approaches, uh, those kind of just, just a, a whole set of templates, even kind of metabolized, even if you have memorized and forgotten things. Uh, I, th I, I believe somewhat mystically, perhaps, that they're still somewhere. You still remember them somewhere and that you have learned with a kind of, um, a kind of body knowledge, uh, effective rhythms, effective regular rhythms, effective variations in rhythms, effective ways of structuring poems and uh, organizing poetic arguments, uh, effective ways of managing stanzas. You've just absorbed this to a level that is uh, below consciousness and that that can kind of come up sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously in composing, whether it's your own verse or exercising your verse muscles as it were in translating. Thank you. Do you have any other questions before we close? Yes, Christina, go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, I just first wanted to say that that was so cool when you uh, recited that Pindar just now. And I think it would be a super cool, uh, like small project to like record, um, like selected of your poems read out loud, and then the English read afterwards. I just think that would be I would listen to that for sure. Um, but uh, I, my question is about what you said earlier about strictures um, and the rhyming being a good, like forcing you to be a better poet. Um, and I'm a songwriter 
and so I have worked with rhyme a lot and um I know that sometimes like if I can't find quite find the right rhyme then I'll go back and sort of like restructure things or try to like fit the poetic force into like a different line and then move things around and I wondered if there was like one poem in particular that like really gave you trouble and that you worked with a lot and kind of moved things around I was just curious about like any particularly challenging uh pieces for you a fantastic question a really great one to uh to follow up the last question because it takes us back to Pindar to one of uh his his greatest poems, uh, in my opinion, anyway, the Eighth Pythian, and I remember very strongly uh, working on this poem. So so Pindar's uh, odes are triadic. That means that they have kind of these big non-stanza forms, um, and they have a strophe and antistrophe, and those are metrically the same. And then there's an epode which is metrically different, but then that tripartite structure repeats. I guess it's sort of like verse, verse, bridge, or something, and that kind of repeats uh, throughout. Uh, the rest of the poem. And the way that I approached these was I would just start and the first strophe would come out in a verse and then I would just imitate that through the rest of the strophes and then the same thing for the first epode and would just do that. And I remember working on Pythian 8 and getting about 60% of the way through. I guess that's to around line 60 because it's a hundred line poem, at least in Greek, and uh, just hitting a wall, like not being able to do it. And the problem was that the rhymes were too far apart. Uh, that uh, I think it was something like an A, B, C, B, A, D, I don't know, something where the rhymes were just very far away from each other. And at that time, I think I maybe became able to do that, but kind of early on, I just couldn't do it. And what I ended up doing was going back and changing the stanza form really completely, rewriting the whole thing. And it just came so so smoothly after uh, changing the, the rhyme scheme and the stanza form around that uh, it felt like I had kind of stumbled upon the, you know, platonic form uh, of at least this, the stanza for this particular, uh, particular poem. So uh, if you don't mind, I might like to, uh, to read the, uh, the end of it also because, um, or the, or the last triad, so the last strophe, antistrophe, epode, because, uh, you know, it's some of my, my favorite stuff and also it uh, um, kind of illustrates this question. So this is a poem for the, uh, the, the last poem Pindar ever wrote in his extreme old age, and it's for a, a very young man who's just uh, from Egina who has won uh, a big, big wrestling, you know, he's a wrestler. So it's, so there's lots of wrestling in the poem, lots of wrestling of light and darkness, life and death, this kind of thing. On the four bodies from above, with violent thoughts, you pounced and strove. For them, Pytho bestowed no happy homecoming, no wreath. No mother's tears of joy, no welcome laughter flowed at their return. They slink down alleyways instead, and shrink clear of their foes, clamped in disaster's teeth. But one who gains some new success on wings of soaring manliness and splendid hope takes flight toward future deeds, for he has caught a passion beyond wealth. In no time, man's delight bursts into bloom, but just as fast collapses in the dust, shaken by a breeze, a shift in thought. One day we live. What is someone? What is no one? A dream of a shadow man, no more. But when the heavens shed their gleam, our life grows sweet and light shines over us. Dear Mother Agina, safeguard this city's voyage of freedom with Zeus and with King Aeacus and Peleus and noble Telamon and with Achilles. Yes, epamaroi, tidetis, tidutis, skiasonar anthropos, right? A dream of a shadow man. Anyway, it's uh, very beautiful in, in Greek. And uh, uh, yeah, well, thanks for that question. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we're uh, more or less right on time. So thank you again, Chris, for this. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, if you'd like to support uh, the 
uh, free online lecture series, you can do so by making a donation at this link. Uh, but they will always be free. And uh, we will keep bringing you at least one a month, if not more. Um, so uh, please make sure you've joined our mailing list. Uh, tell your friends. Thanks for turning out on this uh, fine Saturday. At least it's a it's a um, it's a fine Saturday here. Or what what what, the, what day is today? Sunday. What am I saying? It's a fine Sunday here in in, in New York City. Um, I wish you all a, a a good rest of your day and um, a great week ahead. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.